The following program was previously streamed live. Visit sleepapnea.org to get more videos, audio, and blog content. Also, you can register at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. It's all free. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Welcome everybody to our Tuesday afternoon sleepapnea.org uh, recurring speaker series and we're lucky to have and humbled to have back alive together with us Dr. Siram Parthasarathy, uh, the longest serving uh, medical advisor to uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association uh, and Dr. Parthasarathy is is reporting live from Tucson, basically at ground zero, one of the multiple Wuhan spots that we're having in this country. Uh, while I'm based in Florida, and we're having our, our own little sort of pro problems and issues down here. Uh, but the last time we spoke to Dr. Partha Sarathi was six weeks ago at our annual Wake Together Summit. And I thought this would be a great time just to check in with you to see how you're doing, how your family's doing, how your patients are doing, uh, and what you can report back to our community uh, in regards to this COVID um, era that we find ourselves in, and you know we're still in the early days of this, so welcome and and um, how's it going, Sai? Thanks, um, Adam. Thanks for having me um, back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you and your community. Um, um, uh, we are doing well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, but we are seeing some very strange times, aren't we? Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, um, Arizona is a hotbed of uh, coronavirus uh, infections uh, right now. Uh, we are posting the most new cases per capita population in the entire United States. Although there are other states with larger numbers than us, uh, but the per capita infection rate is um, highest in the state of Arizona. And I want to say that I am at the University of Arizona in Tucson, um, but the University of Arizona also has a campus uh, up in Phoenix. Um, um, as well as Phoenix uh, community is being hit a lot more, uh, you know, um, than the Tucson community. But that is not to say that, uh, you know, um, things are, are not busy here. I mean, things are extremely busy. The community infection rate is um, uh, doubling. And um, as a result, we are seeing more hospitalizations. Um, and as well as we are continuing to do a lot of uh, telemedicine in relation to uh, our patients with sleep disorders, as well as take care of the pulmonary patients uh, in the hospital. Um, but that is sort of the uh, sort of the synopsis of where we stand right now. So the 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 patients and the per capita that you're seeing now on June 30th, 2020, is that different than the first? Uh, I don't want to call it wave because I know that's not the right term, but the first sort of patients that you guys saw when when this thing started. Yeah, we are seeing a lot of uh, differences. First of all, I think uh, where we are right now in terms of the community spread and the number of patients coming to uh, seek medical care and the and even hearsay of uh, people that we know has had the infection, uh, it's a lot higher this time around than the first time around. Um, we have gone past, uh, you know, I think our community-wide prevalence rate for the coronavirus this time around. Previously, uh, you know, patients who got this infection were people who had either traveled or had hosted travelers from out of, uh, uh, you know, town, and you can actually do such contact tracing, and you'll always find there's an external influence. But now what's different this time is that it's endemic. It's essentially local. It's, you know, swirling around in the community. And, and it's causing the uh, virus to spread within the community. This is not an outside influence. It's not coming from the outside, um, but it's the vestiges of what we had before that were hunkered down due to stay-at-home orders. Now that the stay-at-home orders had been released after you know, uh, the holiday weekend, uh, the, you know, Memorial Day weekend, after that, um, predictably two weeks after that, we started seeing an uptick. And that uptick has now become you know, um, you know, quite a bit of a major issue. Uh, what is also different this time around is, is that we're seeing that younger individuals are getting more of the infection uh, and therefore uh, the kind of population that we are seeing or in clinics or in seeing in the hospital are actually younger. And as a result, what we're finding that uh, the previously patients, when they got hospitalized, there was a greater proportion of them that needed ICU beds, and as a consequence, a greater proportion of them that needed to be on ventilators. Now, since the population is younger, we are finding that the uh, proportion of people who need the ICU, the proportion of people who need a ventilator 
is less than it was in the first, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I do think that due to all of these reasons, uh, things are definitely different and things are a lot more serious than they were uh, when the uh, first uh, um, incidents of so let me see if I could let me see if I could unpack and and, and uh, understand what what you just said. So, if the population that you're seeing now is younger and there's a correlation to you know us being confined and now it's local, it's not coming in from the airports. Um, but at the same time, I think it's good news what I just heard that that we're not needing as much ICU or ventilation. Uh, because it's a younger population, or now it's a it's it's a larger volume area for, the, for these patients for the healthcare system. Yeah, I think. Um, uh, I mean, I would like to see the silver lining in this, Adam, um, yeah. but uh, I'm not seeing one. Uh, I do think that the reason why the ICU utilization is less is because these younger individuals, by nature, have more resilience, you know, uh, and therefore less likely to, uh, you know, need uh, ICU related support. Um, but um, but what it tells me is is that it's spreading in the younger community and um, and it's spreading uh, therefore it's spreading from the younger to the older individuals who are more likely to end up not only in the hospital but end up on a ventilator or, or even die. So this is uh, uh, worrisome uh, for what's to come. You know, for what is to come, and it's also doubly worrisome for the fact that when you release these stay-at-home restrictions, or you know, yes, there is the masking policy, and which is you know controversial and whatnot. But we do need people to wear masks. That is at least one tool that we have. I, I never understood why it's controversial because you know even I, I wear my mask because I just I've gotten so used to how much I've been touching my face when this all started that yeah. you know. It is, it is, I agree with you, from the science and the fact standpoint, it is not at all controversial. People yep. need to wear the mask. Uh, but I think the senior most leadership of the nation needs need to uh, to show that, to show- Set the example. Set the example and yep. wear the mask. And if they wear the mask, then there would be uniform understanding because, you know, I went to a car dealership and, uh, and, and, the, and no one was wearing a mask at the car dealership. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, to me, that is what is very worrisome is, is that what you see when you go to the car dealership to get a, you know, a tire, uh, you know, changed out and you find that you're the only one who's wearing a mask and you're sticking out like an odd, you know, thumb. Um, and that's what's worrisome. And that's why I would use the word controversial. But as far as the science and the facts are concerned, as far as the recommendations from CDC are concerned, it's clear as day that people need to wear the mask to in and, order to be able to protect themselves and correct and me from correct me if i'm wrong we have enough data and enough longitudinal data globally to look at the the places that are wearing that i have the discipline to wear the mask regardless of why they're wearing a mask or who's telling them to wear the mask they're they are not seeing active new cases i saw a tweet the other day and i don't know if it's real or not but it said there was more active live cases in florida than there was in all of europe that, yes. that was mind-blowing to me yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, I would even go further to say that, yes, people need to go out, people need to do things, and they have to wear a mask, uh, and that is absolute mandatory. Um, but I, I would like to go further to say that, you know, maybe we are, like the Zoom meeting, come to have to accept a newer way of life until we get ourselves out of this, where we need to do more of these meetings online and more of um, uh, patient care online. Um, prior to this, we were doing a telemedicine-based research project, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, a telemedicine platform uh, from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, where we were, you know, providing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia for patients with insomnia, um, either in person or, or online. And, and that research is still ongoing. I don't have results for that. It's just that now we've been asked to go all online. All in. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and so we are sort of doing sort of a, uh, you know, uh, we have to close the in-person research visits because at our institution, in-person research visits are not allowed, right. except if it's, if it's a cure or treatment 
for COVID related disease where we can actually see people, you know, uh, in person, but everything else is remote. So studies that are educational and I know, you know, we are doing the peer buddy, you know, intervention uh, training program uh, with you and the American Sleep Apnea Association. And that's something I know we're going to be talking about. All of those can go full throttle. You know, what is the interesting fact since the last time that we, you know, um, uh, met um, uh, for one of these uh, webinars, is is that um, it's it wasn't uh, it's a fact. It's not a trend. I can say with certainty uh, that my patients with sleep problems. Um, yes, this is anecdotal. I'm not done. You know, a research on this. You know, systematic research, mm -hmm. um, but they are all extremely grateful, extremely ha happy uh, to be able to do these. Um, um, telemedicine approach because it's so much convenient for them. Uh, even if I'm a little bit late, you know, if, if I'm, you know, late because my previous visit went 15, 20 minutes longer, uh, they're very appreciative of the fact that they're not sitting in some waiting room for 15, 20 minutes. I can minutes imagine that. Home. That's got to be amazing. It's I took the hour commute out to go wait. Then I have to sit now in the office. I'm worried about everyone else in there and what magazines they're touching or not. And and then that to, to take that out, I'll wait. For, if you're running late, no problem. Where do I got to go? <laughs> yeah. And it, it, I want to say that usually our no-show rate of people not showing up for their clinics that they've been waiting for uh, is somewhere around 14%. Um, it's come down to literally 3%. Over the past are you, are you still seeing week. as many patients that were now that they, they've had time to sort of acclimate to this new world that we're all beginning in? That they're not scared to use their CPAP because that was a problem early on. We had a lot of fear mongering out there. Yeah, that fear is still mm -hmm. existent, you know, and I think it's coming from people because they're concerned about potential spread. And I think we talked about, you know, this the last time and it's worth talking about it, yeah. is that the concern is that the CPAP is an aerosol generating procedure. And there are some patients, yes, anecdotally, I've asked, had them ask me saying, can I wear this thing? Especially the ones who are, you know, medically savvy. They read about the ventilators. They read about the non-invasive masks not being used as much in the hospital systems because mm -hmm. healthcare workers are more li and nurses and staff are more likely to get the infection. And God forbid, other patients who are in the hospital ward or, or if a patient is moved out of a hospital room and another patient is moved into that emergency room bed, which happens, you know, there's turnover all the time. They... They, of course, take away the gurney, but they put a new gurney, but the room is still the same. And and the CPAP and anonymous mass ventilation had been used, and it's aerosolized material into the air, and it's hanging out there, and it's got a pretty decent hang time, a much longer ha hang time than Michael Jordan. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, it, so, it, it, it sort of feels like the amount of dust that's coming over from Africa that's, that, that I wanted to ask you about that's hanging in the air right now. Oh, my God, yes. It's killing me. Yeah, and so there are expressing concerns. And so uh, what I mean, you know, that's where we need to do the messaging right. You know what? If you have COVID, asymptomatic without symptoms or symptomatic COVID, you've been living with your family. You've been hugging your wife and kids and, you know, uh, uh, all of these, uh, you know, days leading up to when you became symptomatic, trust me, if they had gotten it, they already gotten it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, you should still try to distance yourself from them, be in a different room or whatnot, uh, but don't stop using a CPAP because of that, you know, is it, because is, if their chances for getting the COVID already is three times that of the population average. And what that means is that when you go outside, Make sure that you wear a mask because it's just not you um, that can suffer from the infection. You can actually bring it and give it to your household members, and you don't know how they're going to react to it. So even if you think you are invincible, you don't want to test your near and dear and loved ones because, you know what, you know, once you got it, the chances of them, you know, testing positive for it is very high. And, and that's why don't stop using your CPAP. The CPAP is preventing your oxygen count from going down at night. Continue to use it. There should be no reason for you to have doubts as to whether this is going to further spread. What was spread that had happened has already happened. And there's no point in you going and trying to find a different bedroom. And if you don't have a different bedroom, not wearing the CPAP is, is out of the question. You need to wear it because it protects your heart. Remember, it's the people with comorbid heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, these are the, you know, people who are more likely to get COVID infections and severe enough to put them in the hospital. 
which we've learned now with a good amount of six months worth of data in this country alone. We yeah, know who's, who's having the problems. Yes, and European studies have shown time, time again, this is done by researchers, you know, in the UK and in, in, in Switzerland, you know, um, you know, Malcolm Kohler, uh, you know, has done research on this where they, specifically to people who are extremely adherent to CPAP, with sleep apnea, and abruptly made them stop CPAP for a few days. Check their blood pressure, check their biomarkers for bad, everything went up. The bad biomarkers go up, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the blood pressure goes up. It is essentially, yes, it's been tougher to prove the benefits of CPAP. That's because CPAP adherence is a major issue. Right. But you can easily prove that the absence of CPAP is bad for you. You know, not treating your sleep apnea and people are treated doing really well. If you withdraw CPAP even for a few days, all these bad humors in the bloodstream start going up. The blood pressure starts going up. There's a whole body of literature that John Stradling at the UK and Malcolm Kohler in Germany uh, have done in this area of withdrawal of CPAP being deleterious to health. So giving advice for a possible additional risk for spread of infection, giving an advice to saying, if you can't have, find a separate bedroom to isolate yourself, stop using your CPAP, uh, th that is not the right approach. And the right approach is to say, continue using the CPAP, Yes, try to isolate yourself from them during the day, but your wife or husband who's been with, in bed with you during that entire period of time probably already has it. And so you stopping to use CPAP, you're just compounding the problem for the two of you and your family. So I, that, I, that would I, be I, what I would say. I like to rationalize, and I, and, I, and I tell my family and my friends and then, and then, and then going out in you know, our concentric circles is that you know, not only is, is the CPAP helping you keep your immune system strong in this, this time, uh, but more importantly, it only takes one incident of not having that, that, that this intervention that's saving our breathing life while we're sleeping. Cause all you have to have is one stroke, one heart attack. And you know, you're, you're dealing with a whole different ball of, of candles. If you're lucky enough to come through that. Yeah. Um, and you know, we have dealt with the same issue in the past and this is where history is the best teacher. You go back and read history. With tuberculosis, you know, as I mentioned before, it's called the Madras method. Essentially, at that time, we did not have enough TB sanatoriums and hospital beds to, you know, put these people in into the hospital. So we wouldn't put them in the hospital. We just say, you know, you got tested. Now you go back home. Go back home. You and your family members all need to get tested with a skin test for TB, right. and thou shalt not go outside your home. And, and so stock up, you know, get your friends or someone to leave food in, the, in your front door. But otherwise, you stay home until the test comes back. If the test comes back positive, we will have a community health worker come and deliver the antitubercular medication to you. You stay at home and you treat the antibiotics. Now, if you're short of breath and if you're coughing up blood or blah, 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 then yes, you need to come into the hospital. But right now, I don't have enough hospital beds to take care of you. Now, what did we do during smallpox? We did the same thing during smallpox. Family members were asked to stay within their own same family and isolate themselves when they got the infection. And there has to be someone who gives care for the other individual who's got the smallpox. But they're not, oh, it's, it's, supposed it's, to leave, they're not supposed to leave their home and go outside because that's how the spread happens. So we've done this self-isolation and self-quarantine for TB and smallpox before. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. And so uh, it isn't rocket science. We didn't say for people with, you know, uh, to, to do anything differently because we did not have a treatment or a vaccine at that time. And that, that's exactly what we should be doing now. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I'm not saying that we are not doing that. Uh, but uh, let, people let me shouldn't stop using other treatments just because they have, you know, COVID. Clearly, let, let me ask you this, because this is, you know, for me as a layman, and, and I'm more scared at, at the worldwide numbers that I'm seeing with the closed cases and the death rate after that, uh, because I am worried if we're still early days in the second inning, we didn't learn our lesson from the first time around. I think this country, we're going to learn our lesson this time around. You know, what happens in the fall is, is, is to be determined. Uh, I don't want to speculate there, but I also want to say is, is, is are your healthcare workers, are your teammates, are your, are your, your, your respiratory techs, are your nurses, uh, are, are they, how are they handling this fatigue and the intensity of this, of this, 
of uh, this battle that we're in uh in this forest fire that's spreading i mean are 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 are, are, are we am i should be more worried about them this time around that that they're more vulnerable than ever um you know i would say admirably admirably well um you know you're only as good as the team that you're right. part of and you know this is an amazing team and um uh, I would say that this is where the masks come back, comes back to the conversation. We have plenty of PPEs. Uh, there's no shortage, and and therefore we are able to, you know, reduce, not convert the healthcare worker, you know, infection and abrogate it and you know, kibosh it, you know, for lack of a better word. Right. Uh, and so I, I think that that is where the optimism comes from. That's why everyone is willing to be able to go to battle to do this. And they're not scared I mean, to go to work. That's right. And so, you know, going back to how did we get out of the smallpox situation? We got out of the smallpox situation because of the vaccine. Because we were able to, you know, give the vaccine in order to be able to immunize the population. You know, we're talking about the second inning, and I worry as to how many more innings there are for us to learn that it's like mathematics. You stop self-isolation if you if you, if you stop wearing a mask, it's going to spread in the community. It's going to go from one community to another community. It's going to keep hopping around for 18 months, as was you know originally predicted. Until we get a vaccine, if people aren't masking, if you're not doing the social distancing, until we get a vaccine, vaccine, we are not going to be able to stop wearing the mask or stop doing social distancing or stop doing lockdowns and stay-at-home orders. That's the only situation where we can actually get back to normalcy. So we got to wait it out until when a vaccine becomes available. Until then, every opening and every reopening is going to run into trouble. Run into trouble. Do you feel like uh, as, uh, as, a, as a, a leading clinician and a researcher in the Southwest United States, now that we are in the second inning and we're learning our, our lesson from the first time around, maybe we get this better right with, with the discipline of wearing the mask, that you're learning with this ne new new batch of cases that you're seeing six weeks later to now that you know that it's it's lasting it's it's way more longer asymptomatic than we normally thought originally thought uh, because if people just started going breaking the isolation two weeks ago and they're already blowing up all over the map uh, this thing has been lying dormant inside of us I think for a lot longer than any of us expect um, am I right to say that or is that a yeah, I, I think this is going to continue to do this. Um, right. And so the only thing that people need uh, to understand is that until the vaccine arrives, you have to wear a mask, you have to do social distancing. And if your community or county or state uh, tells you stay at home or asks you to lock down, you just do it because we haven't gotten the solution yet. These are all solutions that are only temporary. Right. And when you release that solution, things go back to the bad way that they are. So you cannot re return back to a normal life at this point in time. It's not a matter of freedom. This is like saying, I have a freedom to walk into a forest fire. Of course you have the freedom to walk into a forest fire, but do you, do you really want to do that? You know. And so I think people shouldn't mix the a message between freedom and uh, between you know the importance of protecting themselves, their family, and their children uh, from this virus. And until they, we get a vaccine, we were able to, you know, when we got the vaccine, we were able to be, uh, you know, smallpox and eradicate smallpox. So until we get a vaccine, you know, we can talk to you know all of the leadership in in research who are experts in this area for mm -hmm. coronavirus, infectious diseases, epidemiology, and public health. You know, I'm a pulmonologist, and yes, it affects the lungs, but there are lots of experts that we should listen to in this particular area because there are many pieces to that puzzle. And when they say that, you know what, this is what you need to do, you just do it, you know, because they know better. Otherwise, you're going to have various governors, various mayors experimenting on the American population and realizing that in the third, fourth, fifth inning that they are wrong. How many more innings do you need to play for you to realize that that this thing isn't going away? What it does is it just jumps around within the community. It goes and sits in somewhere else, somewhere else, and then when that person comes out, this person's not wearing a mask, it's gonna spread. 
And, and what you just reminded me of and what scares me the more is we were just starting to do our planning since we're at the end of our fiscal year as a nonprofit on June 30th, our new year starts tomorrow. And we're talking about our focus for sleep timber 2020. And we're talking about, we really want to talk about now how COVID has really brought out the, the correlation with all these other organ systems, the heart, the brain, uh, the endocrine, and obviously the mental health component. But really the issue is, is, is that effect in, in that major vulnerable population, the health disparities population, the urban living. Uh, and then if you talk about now that, that there's such a mistrust of the system, of, of the government, of, 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 of depending upon who the messenger is, how are we going to get people? You know, I hear from my African-American friends, I don't want to be the first to get the vaccine. This is Tuskegee all over again. I mean, you've got a, you've got a history of, 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 of the medical system abusing this, this, this crisis. They used to say when you have crisis, you have opportunities. So I guess my, my question that I'm coming around to, Sai, is, is now that we have six months of, of real on-the-ground knowledge in this country since it's really showed its face, um, when we do get a controlled leadership and everybody, not necessarily on the same page, but, but rowing in the same direction, um, do we have enough data right now to start to really develop a vaccine or, or are we fooling ourselves and this is going to be malaria and this is around for a long time? There are about 100 trials going on of early phase one studies for vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Tony Fauci believes that we may have the first vaccine sometime in January. And, and that is grease lightning uh, in vaccine research and all of that is being leveraged. The NIH is uh, uh, roped together. Francis Collins has pulled together uh, uh, the big pharma as well as the various academic centers. Essentially, they've created that and creating a network of networks. It's called the NIH Active, Active without the E, network. And there are this Active 1, 2, 3, 4. There are various active uh, networks that are being created. One of them is focusing on vaccines. And as soon as a promising vaccine becomes available, there was a publication in Oxford University uh, there were eight people who were vaccinated with an experimental vaccine. They were tested for what we call neutralizing antibodies. Uh, antibodies that just aren't there against the virus, but they actually neutralize and kill the virus uh, against the anti-spike protein, which is a protein that's covering this virus. And when they, uh, what they found is, is that in all of these eight individuals, they're able to detect, you know, anti-SARS-CoV-2, neutralizing antibodies, which is very promising. It's a very small, very early study. You really don't know if these are totally healthy young volunteers, you know, who ended up getting, you know, this particular vaccine and therefore did well. Or is this true for even the older individual who has multiple medical problems uh, who, you know, may also mount the same kind of immune response to the vaccine? We don't know that. But even if you can successfully humanize at least 60% of the U.S. population, you can build the herd immunity in order to be able to control this virus. And so it's vital, it's vital, uh, as Tony Fauci has mentioned, that he has concerns that he may not be able to build the herd immunity. The 60% of the U.S. population aren't convinced that this vaccination is good and that it would help. This is not the time uh, to be fearful of you know Tuskegee and things of that nature. The reason why we have a well thought out infrastructure that's led by the you know US government in the form of NIH, they will not allow a, a vaccine that did not prove to be safe in phase one trials to go into phase two. That's the reason the, why the, the, the that's the reason the why that's the reason why we do phase one trials. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that that doesn't you know cause any adverse effects, doesn't cause toxicity, doesn't kill people, and things of that nature. And only then will it, something go into phase two. So what we are doing is a whole bunch of phase one studies. Got it. What comes through out of that is a virus that you can close your eyes and you can trust because it's not going to hurt you. Now, it may not help you, you know, because if you don't have the immune system to be able to mount the response, but darn well, is not going to, you know, hurt you, but it may definitely help you. Mm -hmm. And so that is a risk that you need to be able to take the same things, almost like action replay, 
This is when people need to go and read the history books. The same thing happened in small villages in Europe when the smallpox virus was going around. The same thing happened in villages all across the globe when there was skepticism about smallpox. You know, uh, is, is it similar to, to, to what's happened with HIV? I've been watching, you know, so many of these old movies and talking about watching how the whole HIV crisis. Now you have people walking around with the virus that live a normal life because we found meds. Exactly. You know, you and know? so these were the meds that were maligned by leaders of, uh, you know, certain countries in Africa. And they still, there are some of them who malign, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, HIV, uh, you know, uh, medications. They malign, you know, uh, you know, condoms and, you know, other, you know, protection uh, with regards to protecting from contracting AIDS. Um, and they are being proven wrong by history. But we really, for... You know, we're not a third world country uh, for the United States of America, which should be a beacon of knowledge and, and freedom for the entire globe. We should not be behind on that eight ball. We need to do the right thing. We need to be able to get our entire communities to be able to get vaccinated. I actually had someone who uh, is a friend's friend um, who uh, posted, uh, you know, on her social media, uh, the fact that she said, you know, I um, was very young during the polio epidemic and I actually, you know, saw people, you know, at the aftermath of polio when I was in New York and, and I am a believer and I know that vaccination helps protect you from, you know, disease that, you know, leads to you not being able to use your arms and legs or even die. And I saw what polio did to the people who are the non-believers who did not get vaccinated. I'm a believer. If anybody wants to come and talk to me about my personal life experiences that led me to actually get you know, vaccinated and believe in vaccines, ask them to come talk to me because I've seen this in my lifetime. I've seen cousins of mine uh, that ended up getting this flickering, crippling you know, disease due to the polio or even die you know, due to the polio that they contracted. When, when, when so was the polio not, vaccine uh, mandatory or when was it? Be, this the, was in the 19, the polio you know, a pandemic or epidemic was in the 1950s. And so that was about the time. So uh, this was that, was, was that vaccine introduced at the same time as the tuberculosis one? In the same no, era? They were, they were, you know, different. The BCG vaccine, I want to say, was much earlier than the yeah. polio vaccine. But the polio vaccine... Uh, you know, it, it, it was remarkable in being able to protect, uh, you know, individuals with the oral polio. Uh, and of course, then there was the killed, you know, vaccine as well. Um, Are you seeing as much of the pediatrics uh, cases now that we, we hear about anecdotally around the country? With the Tucson? first, the, yeah, it always seemed to be a second, uh, you know, it lagged behind the adult mm -hmm. wave. So the first adult wave was followed by the pediatric wave. Um, you know, this Kawasaki, you know, yeah. uh, like syndrome. And the same thing is happening, will happen this time around. And we have not seen the height or the zenith of, the of, uh, of the adults, but then wow. the kids' wave will come after that. And so this is, you know, this is not a time of people holding on to their belief system. This is a time for a first world country, such as the U.S., to embrace the scientific knowledge and lead. Yeah. And so right now, the best weapon that we have is social distancing, masks, and staying at home. And uh, we're hoping we would get the vaccine. If the vaccine becomes available in, in, in January, if, the, if that be the case, we need to be ready to be able to do the clinical trials for the phase two studies to prove that this works. And then, by golly, you know, we are off to the races. So until this happens, that's why I think that this is going to go on for 18 months. Now, if you say February, it's not going to be until August of 2021 that we're going to get out of this. Otherwise, it's going to keep swirling around. We are playing whack-a-mole with this. So any governor or any mayor who thinks that they can come up with some way of doing things differently that's going to stop this uh, is misguided. And, uh, and I, I really think after this, we're going to look back and we're going to come through this. We're going to surmount this problem. We're going to win. And the key thing is to lose as few as possible 
in this battle and in this war. And we need to look back. And when we look back, we need to remember that elected officials are making decisions that are life or death for us. Uh, that the government is here to support and help you find solutions and cures and vaccines and medications to help you. Uh, yes, it should be a gargantuan thing, but they need to be supported for them to be able to pave the roads for you and be able to provide a safety net for you and being able to lift you when you're down. And, and, and that is indisputable. And if that lesson is not learned, and we need to learn that lesson. And also, more importantly, elected officials who make these life or death decisions in matters of crisis such as this need to have had a history of public health, need to have a history of service, and need to have a certain sense of civics and that they understand about what it keeps a village together, what keeps a town together, how to keep the state together. That, that's people a, that's, have, that's no, actually people amazing. Have, people have no such experience, have no business to be in office. That's an, that's an amazing suge suggestion, Sai, because I'm thinking about it. You know, it's, it's, we, this entire country needs to go back and take a civics and ethics and morals question. Uh, regardless, that needs to become mandatory. Um, but yeah, anybody who is serving public health and uh, is, is speaking and representing the public, they need to have some sort of training and understand what their, their decisions and their ramifications are doing. I mean, that, that's why I was asking about the pediatrics. If the silver lining is that we come out of this and we learn about vaccines and that they do help, uh, maybe that, you know, and, and it's my guess and it's my hypothesis, and I don't know because I'm not, I'm not where you're at, at, at in the front lines, but are these children that are popping, are these the kids that weren't vaccinated? Are, are we going to learn this coming out of that? Um, I, I, I don't know, uh, but mm -hmm. I do think that when a vaccine becomes available, by golly, we need to, you know, initially, there's not going to be as many vaccines as for everybody else, right? right. This happened with, uh, with smallpox. When villages were dispatched, you know, batches of vaccines, they had to pick and choose who to give the vaccine to. Right. So you know what they did? They did track and trace. They said, okay, who is uh, in, in this family? Okay, these family members were, uh, you know, more likely to be exposed and are continued to be, you know, likely to be exposed because, uh, you know, the scabs that shed from the skin still have the live virus and they can get it from there. So let's start with those family members. Okay, how about their neighbors? Their neighbors possibly had contact with them there. So they did track and trace and actually brought the vaccine to the people who are either at the most risk are the most risk of dying if they were to contract it. So they went, you know, because children were more likely to get infected and family members of these people were more likely to be infected. They went in a triaged manner to target and bring the new therapy that they had, which was secondary prevention, not, you know, a form of primary prevention, but in some ways, even if someone got exposed, we got them a shot, hopefully amount enough antibodies against it to, you know, abort, uh, you know, the infection from being more severe. And so that's exactly what they did. And we're going to end up in that territory. And so people at that time is not the time for us to be teaching civics and things that they should have learned in school. And I think it's also a lesson to universities and school systems. If you make education expensive, then you're going to only give it to people who are affluent. It's the haves and, and the haves and, nots. Yes. And so then you're going to have non-believers because you didn't make education cheap enough to educate them. Mm -hmm. And the bigger questions that are being raised is that should all education necessarily come, you know, through traditional pathways? There can be other pathways. And, you know, there's an entire wing of people who believe in the alternative ways of education. That's fine. But just get educated. And if you get the not just the herd immunity, but if you get the herd uh, you know, civic sense, if you get the herd, you know, public conscience of saying that, you know, even if I think I'm invincible, I'm going to do this because it's going to protect my neighbor. Uh, that, that kind of mentality needs to come into the mainstream. Yeah, I, I got I to gotta say living in Florida and seeing just the reckless abandon right now and, 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 the, and the, the lack of discretion and empathy for your fellow neighbors, no matter who they are politically or what walk of life. And it's just, it's, 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 it's almost bold. And it's just like, 
really, this is, this is what's, what's going to happen. So, you know, I'm coming back to all this and, and, and thinking about, you know, you in Arizona and, and when we first met a few years ago and what, what always, what always blew my mind is that you are in sort of this isolated uh, microcosm of an area in the Southwest United States in, in another retirement zone east of, of, the West Coast, the left coast of, of, of LA and California, you're where the Midwesterners are going to retire uh, and the snowbirds are coming there, just like Florida, the snowbirds come to us. And, and, I, and I'm thinking, I'm like, it's, 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 there's such a mass exodus coming out of these urban cities now because, you know, I, I, I was talking to a, to a colleague yesterday, John Wilbanks from Sage, and he's like, can you imagine being in these buildings and you're sharing laundry systems? With these people, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I I do think you know what we should make sure is that you know when you're looking at these communities at large, for every person that you see that's not wearing a mask in public, there are ten people who are hunkered down at home and doing the right thing. So uh, you know I want to make sure that people are aware that you know we can't train communities with a broad brushstroke. Uh, I know that you know there's you know uh, people who are following these rules in all of these communities, but guess what? Their lives are being, you know, irreversibly affected by the, just the few people who take a chance. Uh, the selfishness you know, is just blatant uh, exactly. uh, and rampant. And that's what comes to that sense of civics and community mindedness saying that even though I may be, you know, immune to this, there are other people who succumb to it. And for their sake, I'm going to recalibrate my sense of freedom for just a little while until we find a solution. Otherwise, this thing is going to ravage our countryside and it's going to keep going back and forth. And so if you look at these cases, the, uh, the, these uh, 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 graphs that are being put out, in Europe and in Asia, there is this huge mountain peak and then it plummets down and it flattens out. And flattens out not at a high plateau, but essentially comes all the way down to zero, right? We are in this nation, we go and spike up, we hit a high plateau, and now we're going through a second spike. This is going to be never ending. We've lost, I heard, more people to coronavirus than the previous world wars. From negligence, negligence and competence and, 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 and the stubbornness, I mean, it's it's... It, it's it's uh, from a public health and from an I guess from an epidemiological what the the quality of you know education environment nature and nurture is is just amazing right now. Then you add in the 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 where we're getting our news from and who's reading and who's watching the TV and the news and the internet. Uh, I mean we've got we've got a lot of education to do. You do from the front lines of the Southwest and the population that we're seeing. We do as we work on 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 the, the telehealth and the component and bringing back our education. Now that our patients can't go to a, a sleep clinic or can't go to an awake uh, group, they're coming to us online. They're looking for the information, no matter where they're at and at what any time of day. Uh, I can't, <laughs> you know, I'm the worst hypocrite right now with my sleep. Uh, but I also know that when I am tired, I am taking a nap. I'm making sure at least I'm still getting to sleep. I know my schedule's broken, and that's you know that's on me. But you know, I'm also you know I'm at a point right now where I'm scared to go out of my house because I've got neighbors that I don't trust. I want to get healthy. I want to use the outdoors with a mask. But if I'm scared to walk in my own neighborhood, that's that's a scary. Uh, it's a scary uh, sign of things to come, especially living. We're in Florida. In, in hurricane area, and I'm just waiting for that next punch to hit, <laughs> you know, on top of what we're doing, pandemic, uh, racism, and every other thing that's happening under the sun. It's, it's just, it's a lot to digest right now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I just wanted to say for, you know, the, you know, American Sleep Apnea Association community um, is, is that, you know, as you pointed out, you know, yes, it's, you know, f you know scary to go outside and about exposure and stuff, but going uh, out walking, wearing a mask, uh, exercising, either in your backyard or in your neighborhood, going for a jog or going for a walk is much needed. With a lot of these stay-at-home orders, people took it literally that that means that they just stay in their rooms and not come outside their homes. And the exercise and levels did drop. Uh, people are gaining weight because they're munching through their day. People are working from home. So weight's going up, uh, exercise is going down, therefore blood pressure is going up, and, and then, you know, 
people are lying in bed, you know, a lot, you know, and so uh, that leads to, you know, insomnia. I know you dealt with that on a different, uh, you know, session as to what the pandemic uh, lockdown is doing for that. But it's clear that it's reducing the physical activity. It's increasing uh, the uh, the cardiovascular risk for individuals. So uh, I, I needed to say that not only did our no-show rate go down in our clinics, but our volumes went up by about 15%. And all through telemedicine, we are seeing about, there are some months where volume was 30% higher than our usual. A lot of this has gone to telemedicine. And I think, again, when we look back, this would be the time where telemedicine, you know, really came into mainstream. And we should not go back. We should not have some weird uh, insurance policy that pushes us back to the old way where sleep medicine, which is very well tailored for telemedicine-based approaches for management, should not be needing to go back to a, you know, a in-person visit necessarily, unless if it's absolutely required, you know, for a patient with heart failure or COPD and, you know, comorbid medical problems that requires a physical examination, yes. But otherwise, there should be parity that sleep medicine services provided through telemedicine platform should be convenient and available for patients. And we should be in the front lines championing that. And, and Sai, I think, you know, with all the work we're doing together with, with the advent of the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute and the, and the great work you've done with your Peer Buddies Project in, in Arizona and helping us scale that now for a virtual telehealth world that, that's primary first, not, not an adjunct, uh, even the work we're doing with, with the FDA, uh, MDIC Medical Device Innovation Consortium, and, and NEST, which is a public-private partnership of looking at big data. I think our relationship, you as a clinician on the ground, you as a researcher, us as a, as a patient group, uh, we can do this in a shared decision-making, in, in a participatory manner, and, and, we, can, and we can take this journey together because we all are in the same storm. We're in different boats and there are the haves and the have-nots, but we all, our actions and our inactions are affecting each other, whether we like it or not. Uh, if we want our doctors, our frontline healthcare workers to come and, and, and support us and be there when, when they call 911 and when they make that call, we have to respect them now more than ever, just like we respected our military. Uh, these people are, are putting their sacrifice in their lives. You're sacrificing your life for us. You're, 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 coming home and put your, your life at jeopardy with, with your wife and family by exposing yourself. Yes, you know to take the precautions and the hospital has the materials, but if the average everyday schmo can't be, you know, can't just do his little bit part, we've got a problem. We have, we have a lack of respect and empathy in, the, in this society and, and we've got, you've got chaos. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour and I, I want to thank you so much. I know we could talk forever, you and I. Uh, and I, I want to make sure you get back to work and helping those patients that are in the rooms and, and, and your teams and as you guys huddle and, and keep dealing with this battle and keep, you know, rope doping it because that's what I, I sort of feel like we're in that, that Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali sort of thing right now. We're on the ropes. You know, when are we going to when are we going to come out of this and start attacking this as a, as a, a together country? Um, and, and, you know, I just like to remind our members and, and anybody listening and watching uh, join us at sleepapnea.org, sign up for our newsletters, join up to our awake groups, uh, participate. You'll find uh, access to clinical trials and some of the research that we're participating in. Uh, and as we build our community, you know, we'll be a stronger, you know, more clear voice. Uh, hopefully when there is uh, uh, some clear direction in, in this, this next uh, election cycle about how do we fix all these problems that have been unearthed and, 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 and exposed because uh, whether we like it or not, everything's on the table right now. And I don't think we need to throw it all out. I just think we now know how we can go fix it all with the end user, us, the patient, working with our healthcare provider hand in hand, not in a patriarchal, you know, sort of of uh, traditional mindset. And that's why, you know, to come back to you in Arizona, you're not in that white ivory tower in Arizona. You're treating the Southwest. You're treating the Native Americans. You're treating, you know, who's coming across the border. And, you know, this is not just a very small Northeast population or an urban population. You're seeing the whole country. You're seeing retirees from all over the country. And, you know, we, we've got to learn from this diversity and this melting pot that this country has become to start helping people. Everyone sleeps. Sleep is important. It's vital whether you have sleep apnea or not. Um, if you want to fight this virus and be and be a you know an advocate for your family, you got to take care of your sleep and help your family out. If not, you're 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 basically you're you're riding a, a motorcycle without handlebars at this point. 
And I, I feel like as a country, in some ways we are, and I think we have that chance to get this on track and get it right. You know, fool me once, this is now fool me twice. Are we going to learn? You know? So, um, thank you so much, Cy. Uh, I, I, I wish your team and everyone there uh, the best of safety, the best of luck. Please let us know what we can do as a community. Uh, our door is always open to, to get any messages out. Uh, and, and to keep learning and uh, be safe. Uh, and uh, I look forward to continuing this ag again and, uh, after we come out of this summer and as we get ready for Sleep Timber, where we talk about you know, our correlation with the comorbidities and, and, and all the different health disparity communities. Hopefully our, our country will have gotten its act together by the next time we have this conversation. So. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Adam. Thank you, Cy, and uh, be safe. All right. Bye-bye.